Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Bitu Seigel. He's the founder of Sanctuary Nature Foundation, editor of Sanctuary Asia, India's first and largest circulating wildlife and ecology magazine, and founder and editor of Sanctuary Cub, India's oldest and only wildlife magazine for children. He's been closely involved with Project Tiger since its inception in the 1970s and spent over four decades writing about conservation issues in books, magazines, and newspapers in both English and regional languages. He's also produced 30 wildlife documentaries and led national and international environmental campaigns across media platforms, including social media. He created Kids for Tigers, a conservation program for school children that's reached over a million children and has run continuously for almost two decades. He served on a range of government and non-governmental organization boards and committees over the last 30 years, including the National Board for Wildlife, Government of India, the IUCN, World Conservation Union, the Wild Foundation, USA, and the Expert Appraisal Committee for Infrastructure, Ministry of Environment and Forests, Government of India. He works with policymakers, social workers, economists, and scientists at the tri-junction of biodiversity, climate change, and economics, speaking at national and international platforms in support of wilderness conservation while continuing to spearhead the work of the Sanctuary Nature Foundation. So first off, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. I'm delighted, Derek. Very happy to be speaking with you. Well, thank you. Um, my first question was going to be, uh, can you tell me about tigers? But I was thinking as I was, as I was reading more and more of your work today that I want to ask you about tigers and I also want to ask you about a quote of yours, which is in English, a war against nature is futile. So you can take one of those, the other one, or both at the same time. One minute. You had said the war against nature. I didn't get the last word you spoke. A war against nature is futile, is the English version yeah, of, yeah, sure of a quote of yours. So, so Yeah, you, I got that. So you can either either talk about tigers first or talk about the war against nature being futile first or both at the same time. Well, I think we'll start with the first one. The war against nature is futile. Great. So should I just go ahead? Yes, please. Well, you see, what we believe here in India is that nature is the god to be worshipped. So whether it's a flowing river, whether it's the snows of the Himalaya, whether it's the wind just rustling through the the leaves of a tree, there isn't a single river you can go to in India at whose source there isn't a temple that was worshipped. That temple might not be a fancy one. It could be an assemblage of rocks. That's what we used to be. Maybe a thousand years ago, maybe two thousand years ago, certainly before the Abrahamic religions too, we worshipped nature. We lived by its rules. Now, I'm not suggesting that we should go back and live in caves. But what has happened now is that it appears we've become the gods we've invented. We imagine that we are now the gods, that we created everything around us like yesterday. That in fact, is the equivalent of asking a monkey to hammer away at your keyboard and edit Shakespeare. We just don't know how nature works. You can take all the Nobel laureates in the world, distill all their wisdom and put it into one single brain, and that brain would not be able to decipher one square meter of a rainforest, or for that matter, a coral reef, and the interactions. And it is these magical systems that we have decided to declare war on, in the process of trying to extract more productivity out of them. That's a World Bank phrase. Um, Rainforests are not productive enough, so cut them down and put tropical pine up, you know. So this, this is just one example, but we're going this way across the world. And when I say that a war against nature is futile, it's, uh, it's to say that, uh, you know, we're like the mouse that roared. We are puny, we are tiny, We are inexperienced, we are new, and we are very, very dangerous. That's why I suggest to kids, actually my audience, the average age of my audience normally is 12 years, and uh, still some of the adults in our, of my generation don't get it, even though the kids get it straight away, they say there's, it's no point fighting nature. That's the bottom line. And even if one could win a war against nature, 
which one can't, then that would mean that one has defeated nature. But since nature is the source of all life, that means that one has destroyed one's own habitat. It seems remarkably stupid to me. <laughs> You're being very polite, you know. But the fact is, yes, uh, when, when, I mean, frankly, because my, the, my constituency is 12 year olds average, I have no right to psychologically burden them with problems that my generation has created. But I also have no right to tell them any lies. So they must know what the truth is. So the truth really is that nature is self-repairing, like a cut on your hand repairs itself. And so we go out to these children and we explain to them that, look, the best thing that you can possibly do is to flow with nature's tide. Um, if you don't flow with nature's tide, lots of creatures have tried to do that in the past and they've vanished. We guys are so new. We're the new kids on the block. And it's better that we sort of get a little more experienced, trust nature a little more, stop putting up that much carbon into the atmosphere, stop poisoning our aquifers, stop wiping out biodiversity. And actually, it's a fantastic, fantastic life. We could just sit back in this Garden of Eden and feed on fallen fruit or plucked fruit and just don't destroy the tree. I... I was interviewing somebody a few days ago who was talking about um, how there are so many things that this culture has done that have had um, consequences that were either not foreseen or ignored before they they happened. Um, he was specifically talking about how um, agriculture affected uh, people's teeth and affected their jaws and affected their health. And from there, we jump to people create plastics that aren't uh, biodegradable, and then they get surprised when they end up polluting everywhere. Or they put in dams that uh, disallow fish, fish passage – and then are somehow surprised when the fish who need to go past them can't get past them. And so it seems there's a lot of attempts to manage or to change things in nature where, like you said, it's so much more complex than we could ever understand. And yet we run in sort of willy-nilly changing things and then are somehow surprised when when they all fall apart. Absolutely, Derek. Uh, uh, I mean, it is the greatest mystery to me is the fact that uh, we have eyes, but we cannot see. And sometimes I think that the people who are doing most of the damage, they can see, but they just like, we have a saying in India, you know, that uh, you can, they, in, in Hindi, they say, Kumbhakaran ko jagana bahut asaan hai, lekin jo admi dhong kar raha hai sone ka, usko kaise jaga hai. Basically, what it's, it's the equivalent of saying you can wake Rip Van Winkle, but if a guy is pretending to sleep, how can you wake him up, you know? Mm. Um, right now, we have, uh, it's not just America, it's not just India, it's across the world, we have, we're in the grip of a disease. Um, it's essentially the belief that we can continue to consume and continue to dispose and pay no consequences. Now, when we speak to pre-primary children, five years, six years, seven years, they, they understand they understand. But when you speak to people who are running coal mines or who, who, who want to get uh, pipelines across the Arctic, um, they sort of pretend they don't understand really. Is that really going to cause a problem? Just a little bit of oil? Or when, when my country, India, is about to borrow billions of dollars to build dams under the Himalaya when the Himalayan glaciers have melted, when we ask them, well, would you build a thermal plant without coal? Would you build an aluminum uh, smelter without bauxite. Um, would you, you know, why would you build dams underneath melted glaciers or melting glaciers? Oh, really? Is that going to really? Is it? Is it that the dams won't work? So we're we're in the clutches of people who are looking short term, and nature lives long term. It's sometimes so obvious that I feel 
I feel almost like, why am I saying this all over again? <laughs> I've been saying it for 40 years, you know. I completely hear you. Um, a lot of times people ask me how I sort of woke up to environmentalism. I want to tell you a very quick story of how I recognize the system doesn't work. And then I want to ask you about your sort of similar, where it came from, your similar understanding. And for me, when I was about seven, they put in a neighborhood right next to where I lived. And before that, it had been meadows and there were cottonwood trees and anthills and grasshoppers and meadowlarks and garter snakes. And even when I was seven years old, when they put the neighborhood in, I recognized, okay, so if they keep doing this, where are the meadow larks and the cottonwood trees going to live? And so I understood that that didn't work. And I didn't have this language when I was a kid. But when I was seven, I understood you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet. I understood this can't go on forever. And so for me, that was a hugely important moment. What, what would be your similar perceptions, especially especially when you're young? You know, Derek, I, I was born in a place called Simla. It was a, it's, it's what they call the hill station. It was the summer capital of the British. And I love playing cricket and you hit the ball over the fence and you wouldn't even look for it because it was so thick down there. That you were not allowed to go down there, you know. And I went back a few years later and I found that uh, the slopes were brown. Um, what was forest was now a vertical slum. And I never even knew I was in love with that place. But I found myself weeping uncontrollably. And I discovered I was in love. And then I discovered how futile it is to try and talk to people who think that they have invented the world themselves. When you say that, look, those trees are the ones that catch the rain. Those pine needles are the ones that feed the aquifers. Those aquifers are the ones that feed the water, that feed the city. It's so simple. A 10-year-old understands it, but when you go to a 14... When you go to a 40-year-old, the guy pretends he doesn't because he's looking for the real estate money. So for me, truly, it was a process of osmosis. I grew up in love with nature, but I never knew it until I was about 18 years old, you know. I've been in love ever since. I think I will be in love to the day I die. And um, how do I put it? Since I speak to children and since I've said that... Uh, I don't have the right to depress them. I don't have the right to turn them catatonic with fear. I do say to them that, look, nature will repair itself. And I do explain to them that, look, I have personally lived a funeral every day of my life because either a forest or a tiger or a shark or a coral or a river or a lake or, or, or a species has vanished. But you guys, you kids, you're going to live a beautiful life because all the crap that we've forced into your life, you're going to fix it. That river will come back because you work with nature. Even the atmosphere will, the, the, the carbon we're spewing up over there, all you've got to do is to restore ecosystems, the cheapest, most fantastic way to bring carbon back down. And that actually, direct brings us to the tiger. Why do we talk about the tiger at all? We use the tiger as a metaphor, the way that uh, you might use the stars and stripes to represent America, you know. It's just a metaphor. It's a metaphor for all of nature. For When we talk to kids, we tell them that the tiger, it looks like a tiger, but it's actually a polar bear. It's a giraffe. It's a lion in the Maasai Mara. It's a grizzly. And it's also the termite that grows in the forest. It's a tick on the back of its own self, you know. We, we use these symbols to sort of say that protect ecosystems, protect nature, because that is where all life came from. That is where all inspiration came from. Our music, our art, our dance, our philosophies, our religions, our thinking, our happiness, everything came from there. You ruin the source of your inspiration. What wealth do you have left? None. 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 But it's not all that dismal. You know, I, I had the good fortune of meeting the Dalai Lama once about 15 or 18 years ago at a meeting that started late and I was speaking to the same audience and it wasn't a very happy conversation. He was talking about how Tibet's forests had been 
extirpated and how they were being turned into furniture that was being exported to Europe and America. And I was talking about tiger bones and tiger trade, and I was mentioning to him that, in fact, now some of the Buddhist monks are actually the ones that are going out and and carrying this. They're the couriers for this. Oops, is that your phone? No, it's not mine. Oh. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. Should we start all? No, oh, no, no, gosh, let's keep Can going. Can we just carry on? Oh, it's, it's all good. So what, so what the Dalai Lama said to me at the end of this whole thing, the meeting gets called together, I get a tap on my shoulder and I'm told that, look, it is your duty to be happy every day of your life. If you're not happy, you're not going to be able to do any good. And the, the key thing is that look at, look at us, we're speaking, we're using the internet, I, I, I live a, a life that's relatively comfortable. He, and the point is that you cannot therefore abuse the gift of life by turning into a morose, bitter human being. You've got to still celebrate every day that exists. And that's what nature does for you. That's what we tell the children. You have the right to be happy. If you're not happy, you're not going to be able to do a thing for anybody else and people will shun you. The world is coming to an end. If I go out over there and start screaming this out to 10-year-olds, apart from psychologically damaging them, I think they'll walk out of the classroom. I think that also holds good for adults. That holds good for all of us. There's so much to be grateful for. I have no idea at all why people don't celebrate the sound of a bee humming through a meadow or anything. You know, I mean... People who don't understand, they, ga they gather all this money. And I don't know, maybe it's a clink of money. I don't know what it is. It doesn't even clink anymore. It's all cryptocurrency. <laughs> I think there's, uh, for, for me at least, um, there, there is not a, uh, there's, there's not a split between understanding how incredibly destructive this culture is and still being happy personally. Because there's this idea that if we acknowledge how how destructive this culture is and how bad things are, that that means we have to walk around being unhappy all the time. But I think we're complex enough beings that we can hold in our heart the understanding that this culture is incredibly destructive and at the same time, that life is is really wonderful and good. I mean, you're you're so bang on, right? It it is true. The fact is that the human mind is a very, very, very complex organism, and we have been given this exalted position where we have the power to either destroy or the power to savor. And um, I do believe that. A new generation is being born with a greater understanding. Well, you know, when, when you did introduce me, you said that we work at the tri-junction of biodiversity, economics, and climate change. But the fact of the matter is that this tri-junction, it's the interactivity of this tri-junction is not fully understood. If, if you look at my country, India, what they're basically saying, Derek, is that, uh, Look, let us get as rich as America and then we'll protect the environment. Now that is plain stupid, you know, because the economy isn't uh, sort of the foundation upon which uh, the ecological harmony we see around us is built. It's the other way around. All economies, irrespective of where they are, are built on a stable ecological base. Now we're shaking that base. We're taking the corals away. We're taking the snows away. And we're compressing the time. If the snows were to melt in 4 million years or 3 million years or even 50,000 years, species have a chance to adapt. But you do it in 150 years, 200 years, that's not even a blink. But the guy is in control. Derek, I don't know how you deal with this, but I, I, I have to say that I look at somebody, it looks like a perfectly decent human being, but he's like he's got his hands on the wheel because he is the minister or the chief minister or whatever it is or the president and he's disconnected the brakes he's disconnected the rear view mirror and he's hurtling down this highway and there's a precipice and i'm saying look you can't do that but there's no more brake and there's no more rear view mirror he says why do you want to slow my progress why do you want to look backward look forward this is the way we're going now 
this is the way my generation is going now and i sometimes i sort of oscillate between exhilaration at what remains and despair at what i see going but in the balance my wife still tells me i'm a happy guy <laughs> she says i don't know how you do it but you're schizophrenic i think i think that the what you're describing is something that is felt by every um still sentient uh non-zombified being on the planet in, including non-humans this tremendous yeah. despair combined with uh with the exhilaration the extraordinary beauty of of being alive you know i i read i read a, a novel about a year ago that had an extraordinary point that was the the main story was it was sort of a love story uh it was set in the 19th century in the united states in the southeast and it went from like 1820 to 1900 in north carolina and the main story was was this love story that i didn't find very interesting but the but the story that i that really moved me in this was the main character was so in love with the land and between 1820 and 1900 in 1820 western north carolina still had although the buffalo were gone there were still wolves and there were still mm. mountain lions and by 1900 uh the forests were gone and he he ended up at the end of the the, the novel he was living right next to a railroad train that would bring tourists west every day and lumber east. And there was this beautiful line near the end. The guy's like 90 years old at the end. And he's saying, you know, it is all expected that in our lifetimes we will lose our parents and we will lose our uncles and aunts and we will lose our friends and we will lose. This is what happens to every being who's ever been alive is that, you know, every day we take a step closer to the end of the line where we ourselves die. And that's expected, and everybody who has ever lived has gone through that. But what they haven't gone through is the loss of their habitat. That seeing, you know, in, in a normal forest, a, a human being who lived from zero to 80 would experience trees falling down and new trees growing up and would maybe experience drought or flood, but they would never experience, for the most part, the destruction of the entire of, of, of growing up in a forest and then coming back five years later, and the place where they played as a child is now completely cut down, and that is something that is that is that is something I don't think we are evolutionarily adapted to. That's something we can't. That I, I think is unfathomable. Oh, Derek, I say the same story. I say exactly what you've said to children when they're six years old. And I tell them, wouldn't you like to live in a magic house where the doors are made of chocolate and the, the window panes are lemonade, are, are, are lollipops and you open the taps and you get lemonade and every stone is a sweet and it's all good for you and you go to sleep and everything you ate is back again. I said, well, that's what happens with the monkeys they live on a tree it's their home they eat it and it comes back magically now if somebody were to destroy your magic home would you be happy and the kids say a bit uncle bitu no 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 we wouldn't be happy I said, well the monkeys are unhappy as well when you go down and hack down his forest or you pollute the water or i said well, how would a whale feel when you start pouring pure poison down over it where it's going to be taking in so the kids get it derek and Somehow or the other, there's, there's this one other, I haven't learned to deal with one thing actually over the last 40 years. I have always, always told children, reassured them that Homo sapiens doesn't have the technology to destroy life on earth. I have always in, in simple language explained this to them and I've explained this to ministers. But now, Derek, when we're fiddling around with the chemistry of the atmosphere, I mean, if we fiddle with the chemistry of the atmosphere, what separates us from Venus or Mars or Uranus or Pluto or whatever? I mean, the only thing that's keeping Earth Earth as a living biosphere is that thin veil, that very, very fragile thin veil of atmosphere. And we're fiddling around with that. We're taking a billion-year-old sunshine that we call coal, oil, and gas, and we're thickening the atmosphere to the point where who knows what happens? The methane locked up in the 
in the Arctic. I mean, all that begins to escape, and we don't know what tipping points are. It's like, I don't know, it's just, everything sounds like a damn cliche, you know. But the truth is that I don't know what to tell kids now, because I do believe now that human beings have found a way to destroy life, life on Earth. It's called assassinating the atmosphere. That's why I'm working at the tri-junction of biodiversity, economics, and climate change, because climate change is a spoiler for both biodiversity and the economics that keeps billions of people alive right now, because that's the medium of exchange. So the solutions are simple. I mean, we can go around to talk of plastics. Uh, we have alternatives, but they're more expensive. We, we elect people who promise us something next week, next month, next year, and forget about the fact that when we have kids who are talking about 100 years from today, 60 years from today, they don't have either a sense of history nor a sense of future. So there is a touch of despair there, because if we don't rein in the guys who have, who have determined that the only way to move forward and make money is to destroy the atmosphere, then I think the tube worms in the Mariana's Trench might go. And then what do I tell the kids? I'm 70 years old, Derek. I mean, I have, my daytime job is just to try and see that my idiot generation is slowed down enough so that they're replaced by smarter people. I thank you for your honesty and I completely agree with you that you know, when you were saying before that, um, you know, that the earth is self-healing, like there's a cut on your hand, I completely agree with that. At the same time, if you cut off someone's hand entirely, then it doesn't grow back. And It doesn't grow back. And that's, you know, honestly, and I, I don't know if I've ever said this on a radio program. I don't even know if I've said this in a book, but I think about it a lot. That honestly, one of the reasons that I am that that I I take the positions I do on the environment is because I'm fundamentally a conservative person, by which I don't mean politically conservative. I just mean mm -hmm. I think that if where I live, the Talawa Indians lived here for at least 10, 10, 12,500 years. If you if you mm -hmm. do carbon dating, so they lived here a long, long time. And when the Europeans arrived about less than 200 years ago, there's a very large river here just south of me called the Klamath that it's the second biggest river in the United States on the West Coast after the Columbia. So it's a big river. And mm -hmm. it was, even as late as the 1930s, described as, quote, black and roiling with salmon, that they were literally the entire mm -hmm. river would be full of, of fish. Mm -hmm. And... This is after this culture had been here for a hundred years. And last year, the year before, was the first year that the Indians who live on the Klamath couldn't do their salmon ceremonies because there weren't enough fish. And my point is that it's one of the reasons that I, I mean, I care about the salmon. Every species, every being has a right to live for itself. And salmon exist more than to just feed humans, of course. But that, having said that, I just think it's really mm -hmm. silly and silly. It's really ridiculous to take a fish that you might eat in the future and wipe it out. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by conservative. That that it's just it's it's ridiculous to take this huge forest, this huge, like you said, the the lollipop tree with the monkeys, to take that and get rid of it. Yeah. For, for no good reason. It's, I mean, again, cliches, they jump into your head, the golden goose and things like this, you know. But, you know, I mean, it's like this, Derek, that I, I can see a kindred soul in you, you know, and I, I all I think is that in India we're, we're sort of right now debating, irrespective of which political, uh, you know, patronage is enjoyed by which political politically inclined corporate guy um, I mean who profits and who pays I mean right now that debate is only which human being profits and which human being pays 
And the moment you talk in terms of the fact that, look, uh, when you do this, you're going to lose amphibians. If you do this, you're going to lose the bees. If you do this, you're going to lose the fish that keep the rivers clean, the turtles, the crocodiles. All these things were, by the way, worshipped as gods in, in India. I'm, I'm, I, I guess you'd call me an atheist. I mean, I, I'd be closer to a pantheist. But I don't somehow understand where people get the notion that they will get a happier, more fulfilled, richer life by filling money into a bank vault that they will never see. In fact, they'll have 15 guards around to see that nobody gets to see. But Derek, you know, here we are in a situation where we have science on our side. We can do carbon dating. And the most successful species on Earth are the ones that have actually lived in stasis. It's inconceivable. It's in, incomprehensible to me that anybody could think in terms of GDP growth even at 0.001% in, infinitely on a finite planet. How does it work? The math doesn't work. Where, what's wrong with their calculators? Or is it that the gray cells in there, they're deluded. The guys who are in charge of our planet today, because we elected them, are deluded. They imagine that they could continue to consume. And it's not just the resources that are exhausting, are exhausted. It's the space to dump your waste. There's no more space to put carbon. There's no more waste, no, no, no places to fill. There's no more landfills available. And the, the stuff we dump onto our landfills, they go into the oceans. And I don't even want to sound petulant and angry. And they, it's such a wasteful emotion, you know. I mean, but there we are. You know, you can't see something being done so stupid and not react. But at the same time, I, I come back to what we originally said. It's our duty to be happy, Derek, yours, mine, everybody who's listening in on this program. You've got to go out and be happy every day. If you're not happy, if you don't find that happiness, then you'll be part of the problem. You won't be part of the solution. And uh, let's see, I mean, as I say this, uh, this morning I was reading uh, a small report that came to me that said that Punjab, Haryana, and Western UP, this used to be called the breadbasket. There was a man called Bolog who with a man called Swaminathan decided that he's going to have high-yielding varieties of wheat and rice and this and that and the other. But they involved pesticides, they involved chemical fertilizers. And now, now doctors, are, pediatricians are telling, their, they're telling mothers in Punjab, feed your child with breast milk for just six weeks. After that, it becomes net negative to the child because your body burden of persistent organic pollutants enters that child through breast milk and that's going to damage the child. Either it will be some kind of cancer or if it's a female, maybe she won't be reproductive. If it's a male, sperm counts will probably die out. I mean, what are we doing? When we start telling mothers not to breastfeed their children, I think that is the early warning sign of the world is coming to an end, you know. But I can't tell that to the kids. So I've got to tell them that there's a sense of hope. So an, an image that has been really important to me for, for decades is one I read in a book about the early, the early days of the AIDS crisis in San Francisco. And yeah. there was a, a, an, an activist who was trying to get people to acknowledge the disease. And yeah. there was a line he said that is always that, that, just absolutely blew me away, which was, he said, okay, you give me a number on how many people in this city have to die before you will call it an, ap an epidemic. And then he just started counting. Is it 50? Is it 100? 150? 200? Give me a number. I don't care what it is, but give me a number at which point you will talk about it. And I thought about that ever since I read that book in the early 90s, that it's you know, give me a threshold at which you will not not you personally, but at which we collectively yeah. will acknowledge yeah. that we have made some mistakes and we need to turn back. And one of the thresholds that would be, I think, one that should shock people would be when 
when breast milk is declared a carcinogen, if that doesn't frighten people, then all the talk in the world about poisoned whales or extirpated fish or amphibians, you know, this, this is getting really intimate and really close to home. And yet still, we collectively will, would rather make more machines, make more productivity, make more. And by the way, also, you and I both know this. The productivity, increased productivity does not actually mean increased productivity. It means increased productivity in a way that uh, serves the growth of the economic system because a functioning forest is tremendously more productive of biomass than is than if you cut it down and convert it to, you know, to... to to eucalyptus forests or eucalyptus uh, fields Absolutely. or something. It's, it's like, it's an extraordinary thing in the Great Plains of the United States. They, you know, they, they raise a lot of cattle and the, the cattle raising there is, is, is very destructive. And, but what they've done, it's not the fault of the herbivores because prior to conquest, mm. there were 60 million bison who were happy and who were, sure. Uh, making the grasslands, the, the prairies, what they were, and now there's 40 million cattle, and they're destroying it. And it's like... Absolutely. It's it's just this extraordinary thing. I don't know where I'm going, so you can just interrupt me and go wherever you want with any of this. No, no, no. I, I, I think you've got it right. You see, the, it's like this, that those, those buffalo there, they were the product of a system that allowed sunlight to turn into vegetation to turn into to 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 calories that was eaten then the wolves would eat the the buffalo and yes there were always cycles of ups and downs but you look now it's not the cattle that are just doing the grazing it's the fact that the land is being managed by human beings who are making sure there are no trees so you have pasture and when 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 it's finished in the in the in the in the plains that you're talking about, then they'll go to Brazil. Then they'll turn, uh, you know, they'll build BR three six four. The World Bank will finance it. Then they'll go start eating away into the rainforest, and you turn it into a Big Mac. I mean, how fantastic is that? Can you imagine? You can turn a rainforest into a Big Mac. <laughs> that that sounds like uh, the future generation of human beings that inhabit this planet if they're still alive certainly not going to clap when they hear that you know but there's there's more you know right now if you look at what what's going on in the world today i mean i'm i'm a diver okay so i know that it's one of the most religious experiences is to go down 20 30 35 meters down under where you only hear the sound of your own breathing but we're polluting the oceans with plastic and that plastic is not just a question of choking let's say you know, uh, causing intestinal blockage in whales and dolphins and, and and stuff like this. When it breaks down, it's going into it's going into the plankton. For God's sake, as it keeps breaking down, you can't see it. But uh, the zooplankton are dying because they're taking this stuff in. And what happens at the end of the day? What happens? I mean, dead zones. I can understand. It's out of sight, out of mind. But this is what's keeping us alive, Derek. But the guys uh, on Wall Street or on Dalal Street in Mumbai, they think that what's keeping them alive is the stock market. So, they, well, look, Derek, neither you nor me, I think we're both, we're horrified at what we see, we celebrate what remains, but um, I, I really don't, I really don't despair beyond the point because the way I see it is, Nature is actually going to force people to not do the things that it that it can't handle anymore. In India, I see now that the oil, coal, gas guys are going downhill faster. Their stock values are falling. Uh, solar and wind is coming in. Um, you know, the air certainly isn't getting cleaner because the people who run my country or yours don't don't really understand. But I do see that nature will not give us any judgments, no good boy or good girl or bad boy or bad girl, it will just give consequences. And that's why 
at this trijunction of biodiversity, climate change, and economics, I see climate change not as a disease, but a symptom of a disease. And the symptom of that disease is that we have fallen prey to searching for happiness by consuming more. If, uh, you know, I mean, you have no time to stand and stare kind of thing. I mean, look at the, you know, somebody told me the other day that look up at the sky and we were in a, we were in a tiger sanctuary and you could see every single star in the sky. Um, and we watch television every night instead. So <laughs> that sense of wonder that Rachel Carson taught us all about, maybe we need to teach our children so they might be less distracted, more grateful, you know. And I'm wondering as well. That reminds me of something that, that people have, over the years, for whatever reason, people have asked me if I meditate, and I always respond, um... No, I live in a forest. And... <laughs> Are you sure you said that? Because I say that all the time. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, I do that. I wake up much earlier than most people, and I like to see. I like to see dark turn to light, and uh, I'm woken up. I go to sleep to an orchestra of frogs in a even in an urban environment. I wake up to bird song, and I have to pinch myself and say, "What did I do to deserve all this?" You know, this is this is so much of it that um, the the frogs where I live are are declining as they are in many places, and in the twenty years I've lived in this place, it's gone from in the spring being so loud that you can't have a human conversation outside at night to being fairly <laughs> quiet. And yeah. I was talking yeah. to a local um, elected representative from from the the the, the county where I live, and. I, I said to him, he lives not very far from where I do, and I said, have you noticed the frogs aren't nearly as loud as they used to be? And he said, no, I didn't. Yeah. And it really struck me, wow. the only way you could not notice that is if you really were never outside at night. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Derek, we we have, a, you know, you, you, you had mentioned kids for tigers you know we have a, a million children and we tell them actually a one line story that takes a whole year to tell we tell them you can't save the tiger unless you save its forest when you save its forest you've saved every creature in that forest plant animal including the tick on the back of the tiger in the process of doing that our 50 indian tiger reserves are feeding pure water into 600 indian rivers and then we have a 10-minute lecture on, on a four-letter word called shit. And I keep telling them that, look, nothing in the forest goes waste. When a tiger drops a piece of poop down on the ground, you've got butterflies, you've got beetles, you've got all flies, you've got all kinds of insects and say, mmm, buffet, breakfast. They turn everything back into something that creates a forest or another tiger. So... <clears throat> In the process of doing this, what we tell them is that when an elephant takes fruit from here and dumps it down somewhere with the best fertilizer in the world, a new tree comes up, and then we get into a touch of chemistry, and we say that, look, here's, here's what photosynthesis is. Uh, it, the plant can only take carbon from the atmosphere. So if we want to bring the carbon down, keep biodiversity going, restore ecosystems, it's an economic way, and the world goes around. It takes us one year to tell this story. And... Sometimes I, I'm not religious, I'm not, you know, I'm nature-fearing, I'm not God-fearing, but uh, there is a, there's a beautiful little Indian saying. In, in, in Hindi it goes that, Narahe baas, na baje baasuri. Translated, what it means is that when the bamboo goes, the sound of the flute goes with it, you know. And that, I think, is possibly the greatest loss we'll find. We'll feel that our children will feel that if they don't hear those sounds, we tell our children that silence isn't the absence of sound, it's the presence of natural sounds. You know, the bird song that you were talking about, or the crickets, or the orchestra of frogs, or whatever, or whatever. Well, we have about six or seven minutes left, and normally, with six or seven minutes left, I ask the person... I'm the interview subject, what what they want people to do. 
but it seems you've been saying that through the entire interview. <laughs> um, nonetheless, I'm going to ask it explicitly. So, so yeah. what, what do you want people to do? Both children, I want you to give multiple answers. I want you to say what you want children to do, what you want young adults okay. to do, and what you want people of my 57 or your 70-year-old, uh, what you want people of our age to do. Well, let's put it like this. All three of them, the first thing I want them to do is not to feel despair, but to put their hands out and search for happiness in the way that they can by following a very simple human rights principle that your right to swing your fist ends at the point of my jaw. And so find your happiness without destroying the biosphere. So the first thing I would do at different levels is this. Specifically, what we ask the children to do is to remind adults that this is not your world. And if you're doing it in, for us, then don't do it in our name because what we don't want necessarily your five-star hotels and your 12-lane highways and your nuclear reactors. What we want is birdsong, clean water. The children have actually written hundreds of postcards to chief ministers, to prime ministers, to, to all manner of people saying that, look, if you want to give us a gift, give us a river in which we can swim and we can also drink the water. We don't need your litmus tests and things like this. So the children, we ask the children to remind adults that we're smaller than you, but we're going to be you. That's their job and to enjoy what they do. As far as, let's say, the young adults are concerned, I would tell them that, look, don't go like sheep to the slaughter. Open your eyes, have a look. You've got a beautiful world. There's still enough germplasm to fix everything. It's not all gone yet. So don't despair. But if you sit silently by and watch while somebody burns your house down, you have no right to complain that it's cold on the outside and you're no longer comfortable. So young adults, I'm talking about between the ages of 16 and let's say 30, I think they are the ones that are going to make a difference. They are the ones that stopped the Vietnam War after all. It wasn't my generation. It was a 16-year-old. I would also tell people from the age of 16, 15, 17, 18, 20, 30, 40, 50 that it is not the bankers. It's not the politicians. It's not the bureaucrats. It's not the corporate sector. These guys are never going to change the world. They were born at this point to exploit it. The ones who will change the world are the singers, the musicians, the thinkers, the dancers, the philosophers, the writers, the mothers. These are the guys who are going to change the world. So if my generation wants to do anything to make things better, and we come to my generation now, first, I mean, cliche, you're a trustee, you don't own the damn thing, it was handed over to you, you hand it over to them as best you can. And... If enough of us, and it doesn't have to be 100% of us, if 5% of us decided that, look, what we're going to do is to share the stories of the beauty and what can be with the young, then possibly more than planting seeds into the ground, if you plant them into the minds of the young, the chances are that things will get better because the combination of a young, hopeful, non-cynical human being a combination of that human being with nature's continuing self-repairing capability is possibly the most powerful force on the planet. That's covered all our generations. But I have to say that when I see the, the results of the election that took place in the United States, I am filled with fear, not with despair, with fear. I know we'll win in the end. But sometimes I wonder, what did we do to deserve four extra rocks in our backpack when we're climbing a peak that we have to climb to hand over a flag to the next generation? Well, that would be... Ah, yes. That Consume would be... less. I've... Consume less. Sorry, I'm interrupting, but all through, happiness is not having more. Happiness is finding joy in doing something that outlasts your life. I, I really don't want to be remembered as a human being who did this and that and the other. 
I'd rather die my last breath taken saying that, look, I have put this into play and it will outlast me and it will give my genes a better chance of living a more fulfilled life. It sounds so, so, it sounds maudlin and cliched, but if you really come down to it, hard science tells us that's what every gene wants to do. And I don't see myself as different from a tiger or an elephant or a fish or a snail. I think I'm just programmed. I'm, the, I'm one of the lucky ones that understood it. The others don't, maybe. I don't know. That's one of the things that kills me about the sort of dominant model of... Um of of why of way the way a lot of people think about evolution that it consists of those who are the most exploitative and it's it's it seemed to me that the way creatures survive in the long run is by improving their habitat and that's how the world got to be so beautiful and fecund and and rich in the first place is by every creature making the world a better place by their life and by their death and as you said, by their pooping. And yep. that's, it seems to me the most important question, or for me one of the most important questions, is, is the real world a better place because you were born and lived and died? Yeah. Well, you know, I, in the process of doing what I do, uh, I meet all kinds of people. I even meet, the politicians, sometimes I do feel like coming and having a shower immediately after, but I meet them and, and I meet people in industry and I meet the, the oil, coal, gas guys. And I, I see how everybody takes even the most wonderful learnings and twists it to fit their precise ambition. For instance, whether it was Hitler or whether it was anybody else, they took Darwin and twisted his words, survival of the fittest, they took that to mean the strongest. But Darwin took so much pain to explain that it's not the strongest, it's not even the most intelligent, it's the most adaptable that will survive. And that's where I feel that the powerful amongst us human beings have got the wrong end of the stick. They think that their money or their power or their their sheer ability to control things is what's going to cause them to survive. It's not. Irrespective of anything, our energy industry, our everything, transport, everything. If you, I mean, you take Ola or you take, uh, you know, whatever these aggregated cabs are, you know, you take them, they, they've adapted to a need. And they're actually pointing the way to a direction. If the industrial world does not adapt, to nature, nature will shut it down. It will shut cities down. Those 70, 80, 120 floor structures, they will not be able to get water up there. So I think that at some point, as I said, nature won't give you any judgments, only consequences. And I think that um, this whole business of we, we, we need to live in stasis and I'm now wondering, so I think I must be tapped out. Uh, it's not the strongest. It's not the most intelligent. It's the most adaptable. And if human beings don't adapt, then we're going down. Well, thank you so much for all of your work. And thank you for being on the program. And I'd like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been B2 Saigal. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.